Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When a person becomes a born-again Christian, they have entered into a covenant with God where they will be God's people and obey His commands, and He will be their God pouring His spiritual riches into their lives. But what happens if that person sins against God? Does he break his covenant with them? Well, did he do that with the nation of Israel? We're going to answer those questions today as we study Jeremiah 33. We're going to see that indeed, God is an eternal making God and he always keeps his promises to his people. And so, hello everyone and welcome to the Key Chapter of the Bible podcast. I'm Russ Brewer and it is an honor to have you joining us today as we study Jeremiah 33. Now, as always, we've got a lot to cover, so let's start in verse 1. Verse 1 puts us into the setting of this chapter. It says that Jeremiah is still confined to the court of the guard. Now, we skipped over when this happened. That was back in Jeremiah chapter 32 when this imprisonment took place. And Jeremiah 32 explains that Jeremiah was in prison for a while, but eventually released. And after he was released, the Lord had him buy some land in his hometown of Anathoth to establish the point that God had a future plan for his people in the land. And, and despite God's persistent message of judgment, he was not done with his people yet. In fact, we mentioned the other day that this whole section of Jeremiah contains a shift in tone. This section here, this is a, a joyful, happier section. It's a four-chapter section where God reiterates his promises for the future restoration of his people. And so this message here is coming as the hooves of the Babylonians are growing louder outside. And when they're eventually exiled, these chapters were already in place, given here by God, to bolster those people's faith through the dark days they were about to endure. So that's the setting. Now let's go on to verse 2. Verse 2 describes the character of the one who is making this promise. Who is this one? He is the one who has made the heavens and formed the earth. And this is key because the people need to know that the God who made the heavens and the earth can also remake a nation dedicated to him. He's not bound by their problems. He's not even bound by their sin. He will bring about his kingdom no matter what man might do to try to stop it. Going on to verse 3. In verse 3, the Lord says to Jeremiah, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now, this is a, a verse that we hear sometimes quoted, almost always out of context, and that can lead to misapplications of this teaching. So let's look at this verse in context. Verse 3 here is a promise to Jeremiah to call upon the Lord and have a greater understanding of God's plan for this people. In fact, this specific situation is laid out in verse 4. Verse 4 explains that this prophecy is concerning the houses of the city and concerning the kings of Judah, specifically those whose homes have been broken down to make a defense against the siege of the Chaldeans. Again, the Chaldeans is another name for Babylonians. And so these people here have given their home as a defense against the Chaldeans. And while that might seem noble to us, it wasn't to God. And remember, the historical backdrop of this whole book is that the Babylonians are going to come and defeat this nation of Judah. And so throughout this book, God has been telling them that since Judah is verifiably apostate, it's going to be refined. And anyone who wants to be saved from this refining fire should take heed to God's word and leave the land and go find safety within Babylon. And so this prophecy here, this promise of call to me and I'll tell you great mighty things, it's for the specific people who were so utterly opposed to God's cleansing and refining judgment that they even sacrificed their own homes to defend a city and a nation under God's wrath. In verse 5, they're determined to fight against the Chaldeans, disregarding the clear fact that God has hidden his face of blessings from them. It's obvious he's not with them, despite their self-sacrificing valiant efforts but they don't care. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. Now, you think that God would say to these people, you know what? You're not listening, so forget it. I'm done with you. But he says something that's almost the exact opposite. You see, despite the rebellion and despite the fact that many of them are going to be killed, God's plans for these people, as in the ultimate houses of Israel and Judah and her kings, God has a future plan for them, one of hope and one of restoration. And God's mercy and his grace and his loving kindness is just on beautiful display here. And so the Lord gives them these promises in verses 6 to 13. In verse 6, God will bring health and healing and an abundance of peace and truth. Now, the word health there in verse 6 is this idea of new flesh growing on a healing wound. 
And so this wound of rebellion that has torn Judah will be healed during the exile and something new will be emerging. In verse 7, their fortunes would be restored once again and the nation will be united. They'll no longer be the northern king of Israel or the southern king of Judah. They're going to be one nation under God. In verse 8, the Lord will cleanse them of their iniquity and pardon their sins. In verse 9, they're going to have a unique status of demonstrating joy and praise and glory before all the nations. In verses 10 and 11, they'll hear the praises of brides and grooms giving thanks to the Lord. In verses 12 and 13, once again, there'll be sacrifices offered to the Lord in this land. And so think about these stunning promises of loyal love. Although the Lord has brought devastating judgment upon the people for their sins, his judgment's not everlasting. His grace is. He will not forsake these people forever, even though right now they're hard-hearted in their rebellion to the point of tearing their homes apart in order to preserve their way of life. God still has a plan for his people, and that's going to figure in very heavily to the next couple passages in this chapter. So let's go on to verses 15 to 17. Now, as we continue in this chapter, this next section unpacks a key prophecy of who will rule this restored people. And so verse 15 says, In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. Now, if you've been studying the Bible for a while, you know that whenever you hear the title, the branch of David, you should immediately think of Jesus. The term branch was a messianic title of the Messiah, indicating that he would come from the line of David. In fact, we saw this connection back in our study of Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6, which spoke of Jesus saying, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he'll be called, the Lord our righteousness. And so, Jesus is the branch of David, and today's passage shows us the enduring quality of his reign. Verse 17 says, For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, on the one hand, this is an encouraging promise of the people. The house of David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne. In other words, there will always be a descendant of David as king over these people. But if you're paying attention... This also presents a problem, because back in Jeremiah 22, verse 30, the Lord had said that King Coniah, who was in the Davidic line, would have no descendants upon the throne. None of his kids are going to make it to the throne. And so the Davidic line was supposed to stop with Coniah, and so it seems like there's a problem. But if you remember from our study in Jeremiah 22, the line of Coniah went to Jesus through the line of Joseph, but of course, Joseph wasn't actually Jesus' father. And so Jesus' kingship doesn't violate the prophecy of Jeremiah 22. On the other hand, Jesus is a true blood relative of David, and his bloodline came through Mary, who was related to David's other son, Nathan. And so that lineage fulfills this prophecy here. David will never lack a king on the throne because Jesus is that eternal king. He is a direct descendant of David through Nathan and not related to David through the sinful kings of Jeremiah's day. And so that's an important prophecy. Seems a bit nitty gritty, but it gets even more challenging in verse 18. And Jeremiah 33, 18 says, And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. Now, did we just read that correctly? Are there going to be Levitical priests offering sacrifices in Jesus' kingdom? Didn't the new covenant do away with all of that? Well, this passage is telling us that in the new kingdom, there will in fact be a temple and sacrifices to the Lord. Now, this isn't the only time that this comes up in the Old Testament. We saw a similar teaching in Isaiah 66, verses 21 to 23. It also occurs in Malachi 2, 4. And Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, specifically lay out the dimensions of this future temple where these sacrifices will take place. Now, you might be hearing this and you might be a bit troubled by it because after all, if Jesus fulfilled the law, why would these sacrifices start back up again? Well, the answer to that question is found in the specific details, the specific sacrifices that are mentioned in verse 18. And this is really cool. Notice what kind of sacrifices these are. Verse 18 says they are burnt offerings and grain offerings. Now, some people might think incorrectly, well, sacrifice is a sacrifice. They're all pretty much the same. But if you remember from our study on the sacrifices back in Leviticus 1-5, to 
you'll remember that the different kinds of sacrifices were very different from each other. They were even given for different reasons for different outcomes. And not only that, not every sacrifice dealt with sin. And in our study of Leviticus 1-5, to we found that burnt offerings, what we see here in verse 18, they pointed to a person's total consecration to the Lord. And grain offerings, also here in verse 18, they pointed to a person's praise and thanks to God. And so these are the sacrifices of consecration and praise. And not only that, notice which sacrifices won't be offered in the temple. That of sin offerings and that of guilt offerings. Now, why not? Well, because Isaiah 53 verse 10 says that Jesus is our guilt offering. He is the one and only sacrifice for our sin before God. It was once for all time. He is our eternal sacrifice offered by himself on our behalf as an eternal covering for our sin. And so because of his sacrifice, there is no longer now any need for any other sin or guilt offerings. They're done. And so for new covenant believers, there's no longer sacrifices for sin and guilt. And yet there still is sacrifices of worship and praise to be offered to the Lord. We'll get to that in a minute as well. And so this kingdom here is going to have a temple dedicated to the Lord's worship, but not to present sacrifices for our sin because that was done away with once and for all at the cross. Instead, this temple will be for the consecration and the praise that is dedicated to the Lord and the sacrifices that will be offered will be offered by the Levites to the Lord. Now, there are some people who are going to disagree with this straightforward interpretation. They're going to say that God has done away with the nation of Israel, at least as we see it nationally that God no longer has a plan for these people, and thus there is no future temple. Even the temple in Ezekiel, figurative, and so are the sacrifices. Thing is, I don't think so. For one thing, these promises here are given to people who are in direct rebellion to the Lord in verses 4 and 5. His whole point is, is that despite their sin, he's not done away with them. And then the next couple of verses seem to completely rule out the idea that God has done away with the nation of Israel. And so, going on, if you look at verses 20 and 21, it says, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne, and with Levitical priests my ministers. Now, this sounds very much like the Lord is very serious about his commitment to these people. He's giving them promises using terms that clearly state it's impossible for them not to come to pass. He's even tying his promises to the nature of day and night. And just as we can be certain that the sun will come out tomorrow, we can be certain that these promises will come to pass. God's kingdom will be established. The messianic branch of David will be its king. And the Levitical priests will lead the people in worship and consecration to the Lord you can take these promises to the bank. The sun's coming up tomorrow and God's kingdom will come to pass. Now, as stunning as these promises are, God even has more to say about them in verses 22 and 23. In verse 22, the Lord says he will greatly multiply the descendants of David and Levites to be like the sand of the sea. Now, you might remember, God made a similar promise to Abraham back in Genesis 22:17. And we take that to be speaking of God's people from among every nation. And so it appears that the Lord is making a similar link to all of God's people here. And so this is one of those passages that then feed into the New Testament doctrine where we're brothers of Jesus and a kingdom of priests. Jesus, of course, is in the line of David that we see right here. And we are called his brethren. Hebrews 2.11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Likewise, Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And so the Bible is clear. New covenant believers are not just servants of the king or subjects in his kingdom, though those are both true, but we're also his brothers, his brethren. And that teaching then makes much more sense in light of the passages we see here, these prophecies like here in Jeremiah 33, verse 22. So the descendants of David will be like the sand of the sea, but it also says, so will also be the Levites. And likewise, the New Testament also calls us a kingdom of priests. Remember, God's initial design for his people was stated in Exodus 19.6 to be the kingdom of priests. But then after the people's disobedience, Numbers 13, the true official priesthood was relegated to just the Levites. That division continued until the new covenant, wherein, once again, 
all of God's people are now recommissioned as priests to the Lord. We see this even in 1 Peter 2, 9. Peter says in that passage, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness in his marvelous light. Sounds a lot like offerings of praise and consecration to the Lord. So indeed, we are a priesthood of believers that will continue forward all the way to the new kingdom where the number of priests and the descendants of David will be as the sand of the sea. Okay, so we're almost done here. And we've been reading about the Lord's commitment to his plans for his people despite the rebellion. And this must have seemed stunning even to Jeremiah. And so in verses 24 and 26, the Lord gives further hope to Jeremiah himself. Now, these words might seem like a repetition of what was already stated, but perhaps Jeremiah was struggling with this teaching. And so the Lord gave him this message once again to remove all doubt. And so in verse 24, the Lord just wants to lay to rest this, this mindset or this rumor that God was fully finished with his people once and for all. This rumor had been growing, and there was apparently people back then, even as today, saying, as you see in verse 24, the two families which the Lord chose, he has rejected them. In other words, people were saying, you know what? These people have sinned so much, God is done with them forever. He's just moving on. But clearly, these verses show us that will never be the case. And so the Lord reminds Jeremiah that just as he, the Lord, has established the patterns for the ways of the sun and the moon and stars, he has a plan and a purpose and a design for how he will unfold these promises. The order, the precision of his timing will be as exact and as perfect in time and place as the sun and the moon and the stars. Just as there's nothing man can do about the sun, moon, and stars, there is nothing man can do to thwart the plan of God. And so if God's plans of the heavens could be altered, maybe God's plans for his people could be altered too. But that can't happen. And so these plans are certain, and in verse 26, God will have mercy on his people, and he will restore their fortunes. So that's Jeremiah 33. Now, what are some takeaways from this? Well, I think there are several. For one thing, we see here that God keeps his promises. When he makes a covenant with a person, he will keep that covenant. And so if you're a new covenant Christian, as in if you have embraced God's offer of salvation and redemption through Jesus Christ, you are in covenant with the Almighty God, and He will always keep His covenant with you. You cannot break it, and He won't. Likewise, this passage also gives us tremendous hope and truth about our current standing as God's people. Christ's kingdom has already been inaugurated in the heavenly places, and we are citizens of that kingdom. And just as Christ can and will be filled with eternal consecration and praise, we can be consecrated to the Lord and praising Him right now in our lives today. In fact, Hebrews 13, 15 tells us to offer to the Lord sacrifices of thanks and praise. So we can do this right now, setting aside time throughout our day, even in our daily travels, where we are constantly, regularly offering God our worship, our consecration, our praise to Him. And so as we end our time in our study of Jeremiah 33, how about we ask the Lord to give us this eternal perspective that we might be living in light of eternity so that when His kingdom is finally and fully established, we'll be among those who have been continually offering up sacrifices of praise and laying up treasures in heaven. Well, we'll end things there. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and God bless. Hey there, this is Russ again. While I still have you, I wanted to mention something that I haven't brought up for a while, but it might be helpful as you and your church start looking towards a fall ministry calendar. Around this time, lots of churches start thinking about what they want to do for their fall ministry season. Things like what Bible studies to go through, what Sunday school classes to teach, and perhaps my book on Genesis might be something worth considering. It takes the Genesis podcast episodes and converts them into book form with group study questions. It's roughly 200 pages, has 22 lessons. Each lesson includes the full text of that chapter from Genesis, then my own commentary, plus 10 to 15 discussion questions that include little exercises like circling keywords, drawing lines of connection, even filling in a couple maps. It's a meaty study guide. Just a few weeks ago, someone was telling me how their group uses it and they love it, but it is definitely not the kind of homework you can just start in the afternoon that your group is meeting. The work requires time, thoughts, and effort, but it's worth it. And so I've heard some great feedback from several groups that have used the book and have either left reviews on Amazon or reached out to me personally and how it just has helped them understand the book of Genesis and even the entire Bible. And so the book is called The Key Chaps of Genesis. You can find it on Amazon under my name, Russ Brewer. 
You can also get a free copy of it on the YouVersion Bible app under the reading section, but it's really hard to find and it's really hard to use. But if you spend the time and effort looking for it, you can find it and get a free copy of it to see if it might work for you. So with that, thanks for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.